last spring, the fancies of less fortunate young men turned to love. The thoughts of the more fortunate turned to baseball. It's then that the crack of the bat signals the opening of training, and the great American pastime hits the headlines. The job of melting off that winter suet falls alike to big leaguers in Florida and little leaguers on the streets of New York. The generations of youngsters with dreams of following to fame the Diamond's great heroes, baseball has meant fun, exercise, and fresh air. Like many another sport, baseball has made way for the ladies. They train like men for professional games which draw a million paid admissions every year. From coast to coast, and even from Canada and Cuba, comes the cry, slide, Sadie, slide. Finally, the big day arrives, the start of a new season. The faithful rush for seats to root on the home team. This is Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, ready for the Dodgers opener. Now, however, through the magic of the movies, we're able to whirl back through time to join the crowd that formed before that same Ebbets Field more than 30 years ago in 1917. It was a period when some of us were young and many of us hadn't even been born. But except for their clothes, the fans and fanettes then were like those today, willing to line up all night if necessary for the chance to witness a crucial game. Though talking movies, cellophane, crossword puzzles, and zippers were still in the future, the push and the shove had already been invented. Inside, you might see President Woodrow Wilson arrive, for this was the Wilson era of World War I, of America's first draft and first income tax, of the Model T Ford, long dresses, and a pennant-winning New York Giants team under iron-willed John McGraw. Manager McGraw, who once refused to play a World Series, was beaten by Chicago four games to two. Boston kids found an idol in a Red Sox southpaw named Babe Ruth, who set a record by pitching 29 scoreless World Series innings in a row. In 1920, Wilbur Robinson's Robins met Chris Speaker's Indians from Cleveland. Despite Burley Grimes pitching, Brooklyn lost the series, and in this yesteryear of quiet leisure, the crowd drifted home. the Harding era, President Warren G. Harding took reign as the nation's number one fan. Babe Ruth, who had become a Yankee and the king of home runs, received the congratulations of the president. In 1921, baseball appointed a high commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. The World Series, first played in 1903, had by this time become the most important annual sporting event. Since this was before widespread radio broadcasting, vast crowds gathered in Times Square. Following the play-by-play -play on an animated scoreboard, they made the crossroads of the world look like New Year's Eve in mid-afternoon. The Coolidge era found the Roaring Twenties at their loudest and funniest. Though in competition with new sports like marathon dancing and flagpole sitting, baseball was bigger than ever under the always watchful eye of Tsar Landis. The Yankees, aided by the generosity of owner Jake Rupert and the genius of manager Miller Huggins, won eight straight series games. This was the heyday of Babe Ruth and his curly-headed Yank teammate, Larrapin Lou Gehrig. A Gehrig homer was an event that warmed the hearts of fans and warmed them often. Twice, Lou hit 49 in a season. By playing in a record 2,130 consecutive games, he won the title Iron Man. Here's the best remembered of all diamond sights, Babe Ruth jogging around the base. Babe blasted out 729 home runs. On two occasions in World Series play, he chalked up three in a day. The Bambino and Larrapin Lou, legendary figures of baseball's golden age. The Hoover era ushered in miniature golf and a full-scale depression. Through radio broadcasting, the World Series was now brought to millions. Judge Landis still ruled the roost. Joe McCarthy had replaced the late Miller Huggins as Yank pilot, but Connie Mack, even then an old-timer, was the manager who hit the jackpot. His Philadelphia Athletics, marked by stars like Jimmy Fox, here banging out a homer, ran away with three pennants in a row. Then Connie disbanded them to spend years searching again for that magic combination. The animated scoreboard had faded from Times Square only to re-emerge in Japan, where the populace had suddenly gone baseball happy. The imitative Japanese copied the American game, but added a few touches of their own. The Roosevelt era found a gay and beloved FDR in the president's box. 
saw the nation through the NRA, a goldfish swallowing craze, two World Fairs, and a World War. During that 12-year period, the Yanks won no less than six series championships, but the Washington Senators always caught the first ball. The great Kennesaw Landis made his last appearance. Will Rogers attended a game with the Fords and expressed much of his homespun character in a single glance. In an all-star game, Fox, Ruth, and Gehrig faced Carl Hubble, giant hurling ink. Here's how Clem McCarthy described this unforgettable baseball moment back in 1934. Play ball! First inning, two on base. Ruth faces Hubble, ball one. Strike, says the umpire. What, says the Bambino? But Hubble bears down. You're out, Mr. Ruth. Well, I'll be. And up comes Lou Gehrig. Three strikes and out. Come on, Hubble. Ruth and Gary gone. Let's get Jimmy Fox. And there he goes. Three strikeouts in a row. The greatest pitching triumph of all time. Four years after Clem said that, a young kid named Johnny Vandermeer of the Cincinnati Reds hurled a no-hit game. Then came to Brooklyn for the first night contest ever played in Greater New York. Under the lights, Vandermeer proceeded to mow them down. While the audience gasped, he performed a pitching miracle by chalking up his second consecutive no-hitter. In 1941, the world at last got a chance to see what happened when a pennant came to baseball crazy Brooklyn. After 21 years of waiting, the Flatbush faithful had accumulated enough steam to blow the borough apart. And they almost did. After the war, one of the surest signs that America had returned to normal was the sight of a president back at the ball game. Harry Truman enjoyed himself like any fan, soda pop and all. Baseball czar was now Happy Chandler. In 46, this play won for St. Louis. Slaughter sprinted from first on Walker's double with two out. Red Sox fielder Pesky hesitated. Slaughter took the big gamble and struck for home. He made it, and the Cards became champions. In 47, the Yanks met Brooklyn in the wildest and craziest World Series of them all. Fourth game, pinch hitter Cookie Lavagetto faced Yankee pitcher Bill Bevins, just one out away from the first no-hitter in series history. Cookie swung and missed. With two men on base, just two strikes stood between pitcher Bevins and baseball immortality. Cookie swung again and connected. It was a two-bagger, sending in the tying run and the run that spelled victory. The unpredictable Dodgers had accomplished the virtually impossible by breaking through in a one-hit game and winning it 3-2 to two to tie up the series. The sixth game provided this sensation. Joe DiMaggio murdered one, sending two runners heading home. But dashing to the gate was an unknown outfielder named Al Gianfrido to snatch away what seemed to be a sure home run. Cheated of his big moment, DiMaggio trotted into the outfield. The Yankees finally won after seven games as big city fans neared complete exhaustion. Cleveland met Boston in 48. Coming up is the disputed pickoff play. Lou Boudreau claimed he nailed Phil Macy off second, but the ump said safe. The controversy still rages, for that decision gave the Braves the opener. Trailing by a single run in the sixth game, Boston got its last chance, but Sibby Sisti's bunt spelled double play. Gloom descended on Beantown. Bearden pitched to Holmes, and Holmes batted out a long fly to Bob Kennedy, who ended the series for victorious Cleveland with a dance. For more than a century, this has been part of America. The excitement, the crowds, the color, the spectacular catches and the boneheaded plays, the slides, the steals, the home runs, the arguments, all the things that spell baseball. This is only the beginning. As long as there are men and women who thrill to the crack of horsehide on hickory, the nation will resound to the cry of, Batter up!